Well, good morning, church. Uh, we are so glad that you are here this morning. Thanks for joining us at church online. I hope you guys are doing well. We're excited to be here uh, to worship together on a Sunday morning. We have a few announcements, the first of which is um, Operation Christmas Child is going to look different this year, but it's still going to happen, so we're excited about that. you have an opportunity, if you look at your bulletin or check out your email uh, with a link to show you how to do your box. It's going to be boxes that are done online. Um, kind of like a click list that you would go and find stuff. And there's a click on it, buy it online. Somebody else will actually pack it for you. Um, so I'm, I love this thing. This is the first time they've probably ever done that. So um, if you want to still get involved with that, something you're used to, that is still an option. So like I said, check out the bulletin. I think it's on our website and the email as well. Figure out how to do that. And I think they just want to complete it around December, by December 13th. So you have a, a good little bit of time to make that happen. Also, we still have on the docket for next weekend, our serve day, fall into serve. Uh, we're going to fall back with the clocks, so don't forget to do that. But uh, we're also going to, on Saturday morning from 9 to 12, break some leaves in the neighborhood across the street, over on the other side of the Junction. It just so happens to be a uh, neighborhood that I live in as well. So we're excited about that. Be here at 9 o'clock. Bring a red, bring a, I almost said shovel. Don't bring a shovel. I'm not going to bring anything. Um, a tarp, a, a blower, whatever would be helpful, whatever tools you'd like to use, or if you have extra, feel free to bring those as well. Um, I do think we're going to have a little, uh, kind of like a horse and buggy, but like a tractor and something pulling behind it that's going to at least uh, take a few of us to and fro throughout the neighborhood and uh, get us to our destination. So we're glad that um, you can mark your calendars for that. In case the leaves aren't, uh, we'll kind of check things out this week. If the leaves aren't falling like we think they're going to, um, we would we just postpone it until the following weekend. So um, be on the lookout for your email and online as well to make that final decision probably mid week. But uh, right now it's on, and we're glad to do it. So kind of heading into worship, um, we, we call God, we can call God by different names. But uh, one of the things I love about him is he is our, he is our strong foundation. He is the rock on which we stand, and there is none like him. I'm glad we don't have to worry about anything else other than Christ alone, our cornerstone. And he can be that for us today, and we know that these times have brought hard times, emotionally, physically, financially. Um, these times are taking their toll. So we need to remind ourselves, maybe every day, Paul said, to, to Christ I die daily. We need to pick up our cross every day to remember who is our cornerstone? Who is the rock on which we stand? Who is the one that we put our hope in? That should be, and hopefully is for you, Jesus Christ. So would you stand and we'll sing together. Father, thank you so much that we have opportunities, that we have freedoms in this country to worship you on a Sunday morning. But even more so to take what we have, the strength we find in you as our firm foundation, and take that to a hurting world. We praise you for the truth that we're going to learn today, the opportunity to stand together to worship and to hear from your word. In your great name we pray. Amen. Let's sing to him who is waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, the one who arrested death. Love me away to let mercy come in. 
get your Bible or whatever it is that you look at your Bible with, I'd like to encourage you this morning to take it. I want us to start in a place that we've started uh, most weeks in this series. It's really the central verses uh, for this series that we're currently doing called Markedly Different, and that is in the book of Galatians chapter 5. It's here that Paul gives us a list of what I've been calling markers, uh, things that are to mark the people of God as they live their life in uh, whatever time, culture they find themselves. Um, in that chapter, he sets it against life lived in the flesh, or life simply lived to ourselves. And there is a marked difference between the list that Paul gives that we've been focusing on and life lived merely for our own selves. Uh, when I look at this list, I think a good way to think about it is to think about it as a list that can give you a spiritual checkup. I think some of you probably have had your physicals for this year. I'm getting ready to do mine. I've got orders setting at home to get some blood work done, where out of that they give markers that tell you supposedly how good you're doing in areas or how well you may be in areas. I think that's what that is. this is right here for us that Paul gives us, what we know of as the fruit of the Spirit. It's a, it's a great way to look and take a quick spiritual checkup of where we are in our walk with God, what areas are good, maybe what areas that need some work. So I want you to join me. We're going to look at those together uh, this morning. This is chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 22 and 23. God's Word says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, that is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we have looked at almost all of these. We've got one today. We'll finish up the other next Sunday. But the one that we're looking at this morning, uh, I think, is probably the most misunderstood of all that's in this list. And because it is that way, I think it's also one that is maybe the least appreciated, uh, the least maybe pursued, uh, and yet, today, when I look at our culture, I look at all of the various ways that we are fractured and divided, uh, the irritation, the frustration, the anger that's just out among people, I think that this may be the one out of everything on the list that maybe we really do need the most today. Uh, and it is one that, as I said, is probably the most misunderstood. And it is this one right here that we're looking at today. It is the word gentleness. What comes to your mind when you think of a gentle person? For many people, gentleness is equated with another word. It's this word right here. It's weakness. We think of gentleness, we think of weak. We think of somebody who uh, is quiet, maybe even a little withdrawn. They kind of go with the flow. They don't want to rock the boat. We, they're not the person that we think of that are kind of put their foot down, have a strong conviction. They're maybe the kind of person that you can just push through, push over. They are the doormat people of society. That's how a lot of times we think about gentleness. And if that is how you think about it today, uh, then I'm going to tell you nothing could be further from the truth. And I hope uh, by the time we're done this morning, you will recognize that. I think you're going to recognize something else. Out of everything that's on this list, gentleness may be the hardest of what's on this list to actually do. If it's not the hardest, it's certainly at the top. It is really difficult. It takes an incredible amount of strength to be a gentle person. Now, the word gentleness, most often in our New Testament, other than the word, is translated meekness. And, uh, it's used about 15 times in the New Testament. It's uh, used mostly for people. Uh, I think all but maybe one or two of the times it's used uh, is in reference to People. But to help us get a grip on what this term means and how the New Testament uses it, how Jesus used it, 
Uh, we have to go back to where it really originated from, and that is in an Old Testament passage. And so I want to ask you to take your Bibles and go with me to the place we're going to spend most of our time this morning. And that is in the book of Psalms, and that is Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Uh, probably underneath uh, the little uh, writing there of Psalm 37, you see something that says of David. This is a Psalm of David. Most likely there's nothing else under the writing there. Uh, a number of the Psalms, when you read them, they will have a little notation that tells you why this Psalm was written. This is one of them that doesn't. It's because it wasn't written for a specific moment. It's what's known more as a general instructional Psalm. It is written about something that David encountered many times in his life. It's probably something you've already encountered. You're going to encounter it again as you live life. And what David does is he puts a psalm together. And this is a long psalm. There's 40 verses. We're not going to look at all 40. We're going to look at the first 11 because they are a pretty good summation of the psalm and what David wants to get across. But David writes this psalm to help us to know how to respond when we have these moments in life when uh, things happen in our world, things happen in our life that we don't like, they rub us wrong, they irritate us, they frustrate us, we, we maybe think, I've got the short end of the stick, somebody's got out ahead of me. He writes this song to tell us how you ought to handle those moments. And it's usually not how a lot of us handle it. He says the, the response to that is to be gentleness. Look with me, beginning at Psalm 37, verse 1. We're going to just read the whole thing down through verse 11 this morning. It says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, like green plants, they'll soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness, you will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways and when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, there's our word, gentle, will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Look at verse 11 again. Does that verse ring a bell? Maybe if you know your Bible, it probably should ring a bell. It is the very words of Jesus when in the New Testament the first words are spoken about gentleness. Jesus, in what we know of as the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, he is speaking to people, and as he opens up, the Sermon on the Mount, we have what we know of as the Beatitudes. It is those things that are to mark the people of God as they live out their lives. And one of them, Jesus draws right from this very verse. It's uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, the gentle, for they shall inherit the land or the earth. He draws it right out of this passage, which ought to give us some idea of how high of an importance Jesus places on the issue of gentleness. Now, like David and like Jesus in their time, in our time also, as I mentioned, we have those moments in life when things just don't go right. And things irritate us. People irritate us. Things rub us the wrong way. They frustrate us. And when we get to those moments, David says, notice what he says in Psalm. He says, look, don't fret. When you get to those moments, he says in verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, don't make things worse by responding in the wrong way. Don't add more chaos to the chaos that's already swirling around you. He says, be still before the Lord and wait 
patiently for Him. Allow God some time to sort out some things. Allow God to take matters into His own hands, not you taking them into your own hands, when it's really not your place to do so. He says over in verse 8, refrain from anger, which is very often one of our very first responses when we're frustrated, we're irritated, and things don't go right. He says, refrain from anger. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. In other words, don't blow up. Don't come unglued at the first sign of chaos. Because all that will do is make the chaos worse. It will make the situation worse, not better. In fact, James, the writer of the New Testament, tells us in chapter 1, verse 20, that human anger, that's that explosive outbursting of anger, he says that does not produce the righteousness that God desires to see. And he says, look, you don't have to respond these ways. Why? Because he says in verse 11, the meek. The gentle will inherit the earth. He says, look, if you respond to these moments of frustration, to these moments of chaos that swirl around you in the right way, you don't have to worry. God will take care of you. God will make sure you get what's yours, what you need, what he has for you. The me are ultimately going to inherit everything. And the, the little phrase, the earth, that, that speaks about the world to come. The world to come is not going to be taken by the pushy, the proud, the arrogant, the evil. It's going to be taken by the gentle. The ones that leave some room for God to work. The ones that don't fret and worry. The ones that exhibit this thing called gentleness. And notice that everything that David has described in this psalm that we just read is about how to respond to the chaos that sometimes comes around you. What he's describing is gentleness. So I'm going to put a definition this morning to gentleness as we think about it. So here's how we're going to define gentleness today. It is godly composure during times of chaos. This is what it is. Now listen, it's not hard to be gentle when everything's great. Okay, when God's answering all your prayers, everybody around you does what you like, everybody agrees with you, they're your buddy and pal, it's, it's easy. Nobody wrestles with gentleness. But it's different when suddenly things aren't the way you want them to be. And the people around you and the situations around you are irritating you and, and they're just rubbing you raw like sandpaper. He says, look, during those times, you know what we want to do? Let's be honest. What we want to do is we want to just strike out. We want to just bring our strength to that situation and we will fix it. You put me down, I'll have a better put down than that. You make me angry, oh, you won't, you won't know anger until I let it go. You will bring whatever you can to fix that situation the, the way you want it to be. You will take that matter into your own hands, never thinking maybe God wants you to leave that matter alone so He can do something with it. You just think in terms of that knee-jerk reaction to get back, fix it the way you want it to be so things are working the way you want them to think. And He says, look, when that happens, that never leads to something good. When you just take a chaotic moment and you put more chaos with it, it never leads to the place that's good, to the place God wants it to be. He says, I want you to instead respond with a godly composure in the midst of chaos, with a calmness, with a gentleness. Now the question is, is how do we do that? I mean, do I just wake up tomorrow morning and I know, you know, I probably, this going to be a tough day or I might have something that's going to rub me wrong, but you know what, I, I'm just going to be gentle today. You can try that. I doubt it will probably work. I think there's another answer to it, and I think he gives it to us right here in this psalm in verse 5. I think verse 5 is kind of the key that unlocks this psalm. Look at what he says. He says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and he will do this. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to make your righteous reward shine. He's going to reward you. And he'll vindicate you. He will work things out. But you've got to commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. 
and he will do this. Now that sounds great. Some of you probably got that memorized, but you're still thinking, I'm not sure exactly what that means I'm supposed to do. What's commit look like? Well, I want to help you here this morning. This is a great translation from the Hebrew. But here's the problem. A lot of times when we do translations, and your, your Old Testament's written in Hebrew, your, your New Testament's written in Greek, and we translate them. And, and they're good translations. The problem is Hebrew is a very uh, emotional language. It's very emotive in the way that it speaks. And sometimes when we translate, we lose that emotional appeal. And I think that happens here. It is right what he says, but it leaves out the emotion. So let me give you the Hebrew today. This is actually as it is written in Hebrew. It says, roll onto the Lord your path. Trust in him and he will do this. That word commit there, it means to roll onto somebody or something, something else. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a little bit of an object lesson. Tuck some rugs out of our house. So um, we're going to talk for a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about paths, okay? And this is going to be one of our paths this morning. Uh, this is going to be God's path. And there's only two paths in life. Uh, there's only two. There's God's and then there's everybody else's and everything else's. That's all there is. There's just two. And so we have to decide which one of those we're going to walk on. What David says is, look, when I come to these moments in life that irritate me, I come to this moment where a person irritates me and something just rubs me the wrong way. Now, I have a choice. I can follow my knee-jerk reaction, my path, which is usually just to let somebody have it, one-up them, amp it up a little more. Or he says, what I can do is I can take my path, this thing that I want to do, and I can take it, and what David says here is I roll it on, I lay it on to God's path. I let God inform me about how I need to respond to that moment. I don't knee-jerk it. I take a moment and think, how does God speak to that? What's God saying to me? Out of His Word, out of His Spirit. And listen, to do this well, you're going to have to be in His Word and in tune with His Spirit. Because all of our situations are going to be different, and the answer for every one of them isn't going to be the same. This is where you've got to have that closeness and that walk with God. And then I'm saying, God, what does your path inform my path about how to respond to this? That's what David's saying. I need to roll my path, what I think I'm going to do, what my knee-jerk reaction is to do, upon God's path and let Him inform me. And we all know what this is like. You get the email. You get the text. You get the Facebook word. And as you start to read it, you feel the blood pressure rising. And pretty soon, you're not really so much reading the words. You're already thinking about, I know what I'm going to say. And let me tell you, my response is going to be a lot hotter and heavier than this one. A while back, I was on Facebook. Nobody, nobody in the church. So this is nobody in the church said this. Uh, but I was on Facebook, and I don't even remember. We were talking about something. I saw people talking about it. And so I thought I would jump into the conversation. And all I did, I, I just said, you know, um, hey, neat conversation, and then I, I gave a little thought about it. And I laid my phone down for a minute, and I came back and picked it up to see if anybody responded. Oh, and they had. Somebody responded, and basically what they said to me, and they didn't even know who I was. They just said, hey, Daniel Watkins, are you always this stupid, or is this just today? And my instant knee-jerk reaction my finger started to move was to type, you know what, I may be stupid, but you're a lot more stupid than I am stupid. And I just wanted to unload and burn them up. And uh, graciously, the Holy Spirit got the best of me that day because when you're a pastor, you have to live by the thrive and live by the things you preach. And so it's like, okay, what's God's path want to inform me about this moment? Because what I really wanted to say was some terribly, terribly harsh, harsh words to this person. And uh, this was just one of those times when I didn't. I fell at this. But I didn't. And I, I waited a minute. I thought, how would I respond to this? And so I wrote back something to the effect, I'm not sure why you think I'm stupid simply because I don't agree with you. I don't think you're stupid because you see it a different way. I just want you to think about this. 
That, that was my response. I was trying to ratchet down the pressure. That's what gentleness does. It ratchets down the, the temperature and the anger. And it was interesting because as soon as I did that, within about a minute or two, a couple people jumped in on whoever this person was. I'm like, yeah, you ought to quit saying that to the guy. He's just trying to give you an opinion. I mean, it was amazing how suddenly gentleness just kind of changed that situation. And when we're gentle, it'll change a lot of our situations. But when we respond to jerk reaction, a lot of times all it does is keep escalating up. And there's nothing usually good that comes out of just increased anger and increased yelling and increased, increased escalation of our tensions with each other. Or maybe you've got a situation and you just don't like the way something is right now. A lot of people don't like the way things are with the pandemic and what we have to do. Well, here's the thing. We can be grouchy. We can just be moody. We can make everybody miserable around us. Or what we can do is we can take our path and we can put it on God's path. And we can say, God, I don't really like this, but how would you like to teach me? What would you like to inform me of right now since I'm in the midst of this and this is the way it is? What can you help me to learn? So at the end of it, I'm a better person. I'm further along with you. I'm, I'm more gracious to people. Or, of course, it's just maybe the person you work with or you live with. And some days they just rub you wrong. Every day you get up, you know what you do? You have a choice. You have a choice to do your path when you get irritated and frustrated. Or you have an opportunity to take your path and lay it over to God's path and say, God, speak to me, inform me, so that I play a part in ratcheting down the anger and the, the, the tension and I inject into this something more calm and smoothing so that you can work and so that this can be something that's redemptive and helpful, not hurtful. See, gentleness is a weakness. It's incredibly hard to be gentle. It's much easier just to let everybody know your opinion and those who don't like it, you let them know it again. It's only harsher. It's hard to ratchet down the, ten uh, the, the tension and, and, and the anger and find a place of calmness in all of that. Listen, it takes tremendous, tremendous strength to be a gentle person. And that's why I think this is one of the hardest ones in this list. And particularly in the culture we live today. It's all, it's just so angry. It's just so quick to flare up and fly off, you know, what I don't like. And I'm going to share with you what I think. And unfortunately, that's not just out of the culture. That's walked into the church. And how we deal with each other sometimes. Listen, this doesn't mean you can't have an opinion. It doesn't mean you can't have conviction. It just means you think about how you present them. What is that spirit and attitude? And listen to me today, because I want us to catch this. The people of God should not be adding to the chaos. We should not be adding to turning up the temperature of the anger and the bitterness and the frustration that is in our culture today. God puts us in this world not to add to it. God puts us in this world to tone it down, to be peacemakers. And one of the ways we make peace is coming at things with a godly composure when chaos is swirling around us. We've all seen people who are calm and collected in the middle of chaos. And there's something great about that. There's something wonderful about that. That's what God is driving at in this call and passage to be gentle. Now, when you read the Bible, a lot of the people in the Bible that we hold in pretty high esteem were gentle. And I want to give you one today. This is our example today. And our example today of this is the Apostle Paul. And uh, I want to look first at a verse that he wrote, and then we're going to go back and get a little background behind it. This is what he wrote in the, uh, we have it here? Yeah, here it is. And here's his verse. This is what Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. He says, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Now, Paul writes this to the church in Thessalonica. And here's the background of this verse. 
Paul is on his second missionary journey. It hasn't started out great. The place that he goes to before this is Philippi. It gets really hot and heavy. He gets put in jail. He gets beaten. It's just a miserable, miserable run. He finally gets out of jail and, and he heads to Thessalonica. And he thinks, you know what? This is going to be good. I got friends here. I, I, I've been here before. This is going to be good. And I am going to have a place to rest and a place to recoup. And here's what happens. When he gets there, it isn't that way. Because word is already spread ahead. And the word that has been spread there about Paul is completely false. But people are running to Thessalonica and they're saying things like, hey, listen, Paul, Paul's not out to help you. Paul's out here to take advantage of you. Paul's preaching the gospel for his own benefit. This guy just wants to take advantage of you and get from you what he can. And when he arrives in Thessalonica, it's not a wonderful greeting. It's a really hard, difficult greeting. Now, you've already had a really bad moment in Philippi. You arrive here and it's bad. Think about your nerves being on edge. You'd be ready to tell some people, listen, I don't like my uh, character being smeared. And Paul could have let loose. He was an apostle. He could have used his authority. He could have come down hard. He doesn't do that. Paul says, when he's writing to them later, he says, do you remember what marked me and proved my worth? Right here. I was gentle with you. I treated you like a mother treats her child. Think about how gentle that is. In other words, he said, you know what? I didn't ratchet up the chaos. I didn't add to it by being angry. He said, I ratcheted it down. And I worked and I spoke and I ministered in a way that was redemptive. It was helpful. It was healing. I used my words. I used my authority. I used my place to bless you. And here's what happens with that. Paul only spends about three weeks to a month in Thessalonica. When he leaves in about three weeks to a month, because of his gentleness, he has been able to draw a core group of people to Jesus. And that core group of people will grow into a church that will become one of Paul's best churches out of any he ever plants. It wouldn't have happened if Paul had not been gentle. If Paul had just brought down the thunder and castigated them, could he have won? Oh, yes, he could have. But he would have lost. Listen, sometimes you can win. Sometimes you can win the argument. Sometimes you can win the war trading words, and you lose. You lose. Or maybe if you ratchet it down, if you think, God, how do you want to use my words? How do you want to use my opportunity and my moment? How can I put my path on your path so that what I'm about to say or do is going to be redemptive? It's going to be helpful. It's going to bring this thing to a better place. A lot more gets done. Paul was not a weak man. He had his convictions. They were strong. But he was gentle in very often how he did ministry. So here's where we're at this morning. I want to give you a challenge. Here's our challenge. And I know it's number two there because I missed it when we were looking at the slides. It should be number three. But here's my challenge today. Where do you need to show gentleness now? I want you to think about that. Where do you need to show it? Maybe it's with your spouse. Statistics tell us right now, because so many people are together so often in the house, kids, parents, uh, the tensions are high. Divorce rates are up. I was just reading that the other day. Uh, the COVID has sent divorce rates sort of. How is it with your spouse today? More often than not, do you snap from a rough day at work? I don't know. Something at work, just something, you're just so frustrated with everything, but you take it out on your spouse. You ratchet up the tension, you don't bring it down. Where do you need to put your path on God's path? Maybe, here's one, for all parents, we're going to have plenty of opportunities to work patience if you have kids. 
plenty of them. They just moments that, let's be honest, you want to pull your hair out, bang your head with a hammer, or you just want to squeeze them? You do. But you know, there's when you have the, I love you, honey, but there's when you have the opportunity to show gentleness to your kids. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but maybe the way you say it, maybe the way you show it is not just cutting them off, but getting down and saying, here, here's where we're at. Here's, here's what we need to do right now. Dial back the tension. When you dial your tension back, you dial theirs back. And kids, maybe it's with your parents. Your parents have some rules that they, maybe you don't like them. And you're just trying to push against them. And you're constantly bugging up against them. And maybe what God's saying to do is, hey, I want you to take your path and put it on my path. And that path right now means that you submit to that. And you don't make it hard on them because they're trying to do the best they can for you, even if you don't think it's the way it is sometimes. Maybe it's the person at work or the person in your extended family and just drive you nuts. And rub you raw. And you know what? You, you just want to let them have it. But maybe what you do is think about how could I handle that better so God can work in that and it can be a redemptive healing moment for them. I'm going to tell you something. I haven't ever seen anybody won into the kingdom by harshness and meanness. I've seen them driven away. But I have seen gentleness break some pretty strong opinions and attitudes to where people came around. So where is it today that you need to be gentle? You need to take your path and put it on God's path. You know, this word that we're talking about here uh, actually was not first used with human beings. It was actually first used with animals. Uh, and it was especially used with horses. Anybody here ever rode a horse? Yeah. I mean, you sit on top of that thing and it's incredible. You're looking at this animal, and, and they're incredibly powerful animals. They can pull about three times their weight, which means they can pull upward uh, in the neighborhood of somewhere in about the neighborhood of 25 to 3,000 pounds. And now we're not talking about pulling it for an inch. We're talking about pulling it sometimes for up to a mile. Uh, today, when we talk about strength, we uh, call our cars in terms of horsepower. We still talk about horsepower. That's how we measure strength. They're incredibly strong animals. Years and years and years ago, when I was like a little boy, behind us lived a family, and they had horses. And one day, I got to go riding. Some of the other kids in the neighborhood did. And we were riding the horses. And of course, I'm littler than I am now. I'm not like big, big now, but I was a little boy. And I'm on this huge horse, fully adult grown horse. And you know, it amazed me. You got this rein in your hand, and you can just pull it. I think go anywhere I tell it. It was incredible. It would, it would bow underneath my direction. That was until we got to a place in the field that was muddy and wet and I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know any better and I walked the horse right into it. And let me tell you, when that horse walked into that, it was over. That I, I, I didn't get to feel the power of the horse because that thing started bucking and throwing. I mean, it was doing everything it could to get up out of it. I didn't like that feeling of I'm going down. And it's just going everywhere. I'm just hanging on for life. I just want to survive and not hit the ground. And finally it gets out and I pull on those reins again. And instantly that horse was back under my control. And it did everything I said until I parked it inside the water. Now see, here's how it is in our lives. When we come up to the moments that we feel like we're sinking. We just feel so agitated and, and so frustrated. We can be like a horse in the pit. We can just let it out. We can let the wild side go. We're going to say what we got to say, and we're going to fix it the way we're going to fix it, and we're going to get things done, and we can do that. But see, that isn't productive. It's only when that horse, with all of its power, was under command, and it was held under, that it could be used to do something good. We will never be able to do good things if we just knee-jerk reaction to our situations, to just let our anger go and say what we think we gotta say. That will never happen. 
We will just add chaos to chaos and it will be worse. Or we can let God harness us. We can let the Spirit of God reign over us. We can thank God. What do you want your path to say to my path? And God will work and use us in a redemptive way, a healing way, a blessing way, and we can still stand for what's right and for what's good. And people will be far more ready to give us an ear and a hear. Gentleness. I think it's in short supply today. And I think it's something all of us need to take up and pursue, particularly in our world today. Pray with me today. Father, we love you today, and we ask that you would help us to become more gentle people. This, I know for me, this is one of the most difficult things. It's just so hard when you become frustrated and irritated to just not let it out. Just, just to do what you want to do with it. Seldom does that work good. So, Father, today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to bow our paths to your path. Father, right now, as we think about maybe a person, a situation, would you help us to take your path, your instruction today on that? In a world that has become filled with so much rancor and anger and frustration, would you let us be a healing balm? Would you let us be a blessing? Would you let us be the, the means of ratcheting that down with words, actions, and attitudes filled with gentleness? I pray and ask that today in the name of Jesus.
you to think this week, and as you go home today, because sometimes we don't always instantly see the area that God wants to work on. It's, it's hidden from us. Maybe to ask God, where is that area I need to exhibit gentleness? And I know this is hard to do, but if you need or want prayer, uh, let me know afterwards. We can distance enough or walk outside, but we still want you to have that opportunity. If there's something you would love to have, uh, have prayer with somebody, we'd love to do that. So uh, let me have you join me. I want us to pray, and then we'll head out into the day that God's given us. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the gentleness that you have shown with us. You don't give us what we deserve. You give us what we need. You speak to us in words of gentleness but truth. You call us to you, and when we come to you, Lord, you treat us with the gentleness. You, you don't berate us and try to always put us down for every area that we come up short. You tell us truth, but you love us, and you gently guide us along to know you better and walk with you closer. May our lives exhibit, exhibit that gentleness with other people. May we be slow to speak, slow to anger, quicker to hear, quicker to understand. And may our responses be informed by your path, your truth to us as we deal with other people. Father, I'm pretty sure in some way or fashion we'll need that this week, so help us. May we be known for gentleness in a culture of anger and irritation. I pray and I ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank those of you that are watching my video for joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. And God bless you. Have a great day and have a great week. Take care.